The angel of the Lord many times is is Jehovah, which is the pre-incarnate Christ. Did you get that? When you see the angel of the Lord in the Bible, many times that is the pre-incarnate Christ. And there's where the Jehovah Witnesses go astray in that saying, that's Michael the archangel. Because Michael means what? He who is like God. He who is like God. It doesn't say he who is God. Now, your Jehovah Witnesses have at least two gods. Do you know that? They have God the Father, and they have God the Son that God the Father created. And he's a little God, not big God, little God. He's a God. Now, that's too many gods in the Bible. Jesus Christ is the physical expression of the Godhead, period. That's what he is, the physical expression of the Godhead. All right. Brother Roger, do you have a question? Through all of these studies that we've had got on God's eternal purpose, do you have a question? Uh, yes. So, the Abrahamic covenant and the Davidic covenant. Yes. So, the Abrahamic, Abrahamic covenant. Thank you. It's that he will be fruitful and multiply and, and be like the sands of the sea. And then. And like he, what? And like the stars of the sky. Okay. Yeah. What do the sands of the sea rep represent? The sands it's, of the sea. It's, it's That's the his. The okay, right? that is his physical seed, the sands of the sea. Okay. The stars of heaven are what? Are the people that come to His know physical Christ. seed that are born again that know the Lord. Okay. Okay. Now, but then the second part of that is that they will get, get all the land back. They will get the land back in the land of Palestine. And I mean, it's really now. We have to realize that people don't believe that in the world. They think that if we believe that the Bible is literally fulfilled, that's profaning the Bible, saying that it is carnal. You understand that? Brother Roger, you know what I'm talking about. The amillennialist and the people that do not believe in the literal, the literal fulfillment of those prophecies those are the ones that say to make them literal would profane them, but would make it carnal. Physical is carnal to them. But those promises are throughout the Bible, just woven in the tapestry of the Bible, and they're all over the place. If you don't believe that, what part of the Bible won't you believe that's literal? Hmm? Well, you think the believe. world literally created the heavens and the earth? Literally? Or did it evolve? Well, and how can they separate the part where they're going to get the land back from Abraham being the father of many? Well, they always they're, they're say... One, they're one from it. This is also called what kind of theology, Brother Pedro? What kind of pop, uh, uh, theology is this? This is replacement theology. What's replacement theology? Uh, it's where they replace... They, they make things spiritualized. Okay, they take the church and apply all the Davidic and Abrahamic covenant and all the promises to that to the church. Okay? I might say that those people believe that are not even in the church. <laughs> and the church, the family of God, and the kingdom are separate entities, and that's what we're going to talk about today. The church, the family of God, and the kingdom. So what is the Davidic? The Davidic covenant literally means that there will be a king of Israel on the throne for 1,000 years right there. In the there. millennium. Yes. And if you flip this chart over, we still have the kingdom age of the millennial age here, and it is actually physical. It is a real, real. We believe that. We believe it's real. Not a spiritual kingdom. It's real. I know the Abrahamic covenant is in Genesis, but where is the Davidic covenant? The covenant that God made with David, that his seed would be upon the throne. And it even goes further than that from the 48th to the 50th chapter of the book of Genesis. It tells us that in Exodus. Because there we have the prophecies that jo Joseph made and Jacob, that is, Jacob made to his sons that said a scepter would not depart from the, the feet of Judah until Shiloh comes and Shiloh comes the Lord comes and then the Lord Jesus in Genesis I mean not Genesis but Revelation the 19th chapter Jesus is Adonai Adonaiim and as a Hebrew term you remember what that one means Adonai Adonaiim 
Brother Roger. King of Kings. King of King and Lord of Lords. Remember that one? Christine, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And Revelation, the 19th chapter, tells us that Jesus is Lord of Lords and King of Kings, doesn't it? And that's the fulfillment of the Jehovah title, Adonai Ha Adonaiim. Say that with me. Adonai Ha Adonaiim. Okay. Adonai means Lord, King of all, like potentate. All right. Remember, you weren't there last night. Last night, I used the word works, duete. Duete. And duete means come, doesn't it? Come. It means to come. Brother Roger, do you remember the etymology of that word, duete? Mm -hmm. All right. It comes from the word domini. Latin. I mean, it doesn't come from domini, but the word domini means, anadomino means what? Anadomini? The year of our Lord. Now, if Jesus is your Lord, you come when he calls. If he's your Lord, duete, when he says come, he did. And there he was calling out his church in Mark, the first chapter. He's calling out his church. And he says, Duete, you come if you hear. You come and obey. You hear and you come because he is your Lord. So many people, how many times do you hear the gospel preached? I preached the gospel Sunday morning. And I gave an invitation. You heard that, Christine. And nobody came. All right, nobody came. Duete, come and follow me. Come, if I am your Lord and Master, come and follow me. Okay? That's part of it. Did I answer your question just a little bit? Yeah, so so then the second part is that if if they don't believe that there will be a king on that... A literal throne, kingdom. A literal king yeah. in, um, in the millennium, and they say... They don't believe the millennium is there. Right, and they say, what, what was that verse that they said, until the Lord comes or something? Okay, that's, yeah... Uh, okay, well, there will not be a ruler depart from the knees of Judah until Shiloh comes, until the Lord comes. And, Shiloh is and he is. did come, didn't he? Okay, that's what but I then, asked, according to the Davidic promise, he will be on the throne. Was Jesus ever on the throne? No. Okay. Was he ever that, on the throne? That's what I was going to ask. So are they saying when Jesus came the first time, or are they saying when he comes the second time, but that well, well, wait a minute. Now we got to go back, and the spiritual kingdom is in the world today. It's already there, according to them. They're in the kingdom of God today. But we need to separate the kingdom, the family of God, and the church. And that's what we're going to go into today: the kingdom, the family of God, and the church. The kingdom will be here. The kingdom of God. Now I will say this: the kingdom of God, the administrators of God's kingdom today are who, brother Pedro? The church. You all agree with that? The administrators of God's kingdom, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Matthew 16, 18. Is the devil tried to overcome this? Did he try to overcome the church? Mm -hmm. In church history, absolutely he tried. But the Lord said, I'll be with you until the end of the age. The gates of hell shall not wrestle her down. But when it says the gates of hell shall not do it, it means the gates of hell would try to do it. But they would not. The true churches are going to be here in the world today. All right. And what is the church? What is the church? Tell me what the church is. Okay. It is an assembly of saved, regenerated, baptized believers. Did you hear the word regenerated? There are so many people in churches today that are not regenerated. Baptists always believed in a regenerated membership. What's a regenerated? Changed. They changed. Would you call that the converted? They're converted. They're converted. They are converted. All right. The word, I preached that on Sunday morning. We have an adversary and an advocate. And I talked about those who were converted and those not. And last Sunday night, the same way, last night, I preached on that in, in Mark, the first chapter. We talked about a converted membership. That's converted. They ought to look, smell, and act like Christians. They ought to. They ought to. That's what ought to happen. Now, Baptists have always stood for that all the way down through the ages. I want you to look up here. What's the word Puritan mean? Puritan. Like set aside or 
Puritans. Why did they call them Puritans? Because they believed in the Bible. They, they believed in pure lives. Now, we have, to, we have to look back. What's going on back there? We have the church and the state has become one. Okay? And the church, all they're doing is going out and baptizing everybody, and you've got to be a member of the church and the state. The, the Roman Empire became the Holy Roman Empire, which wasn't quite so holy. But they went out and baptized everybody, and bab babies and everybody. They baptized everybody, and that, they were a member of the church. The uh, Puritans said these are not the church because they're not living holy, dedicated, sanctified lives. It's different. They're not living lives that are, that are representative of a Christian attitude. Okay, that's it. They're called Cathari. What does Cathari mean? It comes from Catharizo in Greek. That means pure ones, the Cathari. The pure ones. Do you understand? Because the rest of the world wasn't. Those Catholics were going out and killing people and converting them, and all they could, their wages were what they could steal, and their forgiveness for all the women they would rape, kill, murder, eat. They ate them. They ate women. You know, this delicacies. They did. I mean, you study church history, you find it out. Read Samuel Moreland the churches of the valleys of the Piedmont, and that was in the 1500s. They were still eating women and raping and pillaging. Puritans, Cathari, Paterines. What does Paterines mean? The sufferers, because they suffered for their pure lives. You come all the way down here, and you see all of these, the uh, Albigenses. Albigenses mean what? Albigenses. French, Albi, Genesis. This means a regenerated people. Regenerated or white people. Albi, Genesis. White people. A generation of white, pure people. This is the churches down to the ages. The churches that have come down to the ages. See the Albi, Genesis there? The Hendricians? The uh, Novations? The Paterines here still, you see all of these. The Arnoldists, all of these came through here. And then we have the Waldenses. The Waldenses, and from the Waldenses, what two groups do we have in the world today that are ancient Christians? Baptists. Oh, Baptists, but what are the ones that really stand out? The people that live back in Pennsylvania. Yeah. Where are they? Amish. Amish. The Amish and Mennonites. 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 These people are ancient Baptists, and they came from the valleys of the Piedmont. They went in there, and they went into Germany, and they were called Mennonites. Menno Simmons was a Catholic priest. He got converted. Started preaching. All right? Baptists converted him. It, it, it's so, so funny and hilarious in church history. Many missionaries went out from the Methodist, the Congregationalist, all kinds of stuff, and they would go out and they'd take these long boat rides wherever they were going. And on the boat ride, they'd read the Bible, and guess what happened to them? They got converted. And whenever they got where they were going, they were look, start looking for Baptists to baptize them. Because they, the Bible will make you that way. It's going to convert you. It'll convert you if you will. So we have these things here. We have this. Now, we have a literal kingdom to come. I believe that, Okay. I think that's foundational in the scriptures. We have a tribulation period that's coming upon the earth. We have the end of the church age right here. I might say this. When I first began to, to study Baptist works, my teacher came from Cheryl Ford and from the Little Rock Seminary, and they were all last of the week believers. They all believed that. But as I studied the Bible, I began to have more and more problems with that theology. And I said, I think last week, that that uh, it Bible in eight ages, L.D. Foreman believed in a midweek rapture, all right, middle of the week, and I said that's possible. Why? Because you still got some live people to go in the millennium. If you get everybody saved right here at the end of the week, you don't have anybody to populate the millennium. No unsaved people are going to go there. And we're going to see some things other than that today. So, 
my beliefs just, I mean, and there's continual raptures. There's all kinds of theories, okay, of that. But I, what I believe is that the Lord, First Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, the Lord comes back and His parousia coming, and He gathers up His all the saved and the church. And how long is this period of time, Brother Pedro? How long? How, how long is this this period of time? Seven years. Okay, it's a week of years. How long will the wedding feast? A week. We're going to see that a little bit later. Now, I don't want to bother anybody out there that's listening to this maybe believe in the last of the week that you got problems. <laughs> you got some theological problems with the rest of the Bible. You got the last trump. There, I've got the book in there, which I didn't bring in here, The Last Trump by Cyril Ford. And he bases all of his belief on the rapture is the last trump. Which last trump? <laughs> you know, there's a lot of trumps in here during this period of time. If you turn this over and look at that tribulation period like this, see all these trumpets? All right, and bowls. And yet still, we know that there's a tribulation period. In the middle of the tribulation, the first three and a half years, we don't know what's going on except we had the rapture in the first of it. The rapture takes, if I'm right about that, the rapture takes place in the front. Here, so how long will the how long will it be if the rapture is here before the antichrist stands in the temple in Jerusalem? Three and a half years, and a half years. to the day it says that doesn't it? Does it or does it not? Okay, now and no man knows of this coming here, does he? Do they? They said you cannot calculate it. You cannot do that. We don't know that coming. We know this coming, don't we? Do we or not? Do we know this coming? Because it's exactly three and a half years after this event. So this coming and that coming, we know, don't we? This one we don't know. Period. We don't know. Do you have a question? Yes. Where would it be if it's half? It would be around the seal. What? If it's half, you know, half a tribulation would be around the seals. Well... The seals, you don't have these seals. Now, we have them like this, but I have another chart that I drew up that puts all these things together. They're not just boom, 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 boom like that, but we come here and we have seals and trumpets all over the place during this whole period of time. This here, we talk about seals here, and we talk about trumpets here, and we talk about the bowls here. We find out when the bowls of wrath are poured out on the earth, where's the church? Where's the church? It's gone. It's gone. It's in heaven. Already. It's already there. It's gone. When the bowls come down, church is gone. We're going to see that in one of the little deals today. So because we know that the Antichrist manifests himself three and a half years and after, after the rapture, we know that three and a half years at the end is when God, Jesus comes back and wipes them out. That's another dot in the trail. That's, that that's crossing the T's and dotting the I's in that situation theologically. Because okay. if it was if it was mid tribulation and the Antichrist rose up, then we would. Know we know the days. We know exactly. We know exactly. And oh. then and then where how how where are the scriptures that that put all these dots together? Oh, you, that's all of them. I know. Yeah, I, 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 we're yeah. going to look at some of it today a little bit, but we will do that when we study the Book of Revelation. Oh, okay. Now I did that a bunch of times. Already, we'll do it again. Okay. When we at the end of the of the uh, church history, we're going to do that at the end of church history because that's when we get into the second coming at the end of church history. Go down on page 140. Abraham had hope in that city to come and looked for it by faith. Is it is it in existence today? Jesus said, "I'm going to do what when he left." I'm going to go build that city. Now, that city is out yonder in heaven someplace. Okay? It's going to come down. New Jerusalem is out there. We don't know where it is, but it's out there. It's there. He's built it. Abraham a hope in that city to come and look for it by faith as he pilgrimed in the world. Pilgrim. What does a pilgrim do? What's a pilgrim do? They're from one, they're from one location to another. Yeah, they're, they're, they're what we call full-time RVers. Okay, they don't have any home. Okay, they they don't have any. They're living in tents. Okay, 
or in a mobile home, motor home, or whatever, and would make it appear to be a literal city. We believe that New Jerusalem is a literal city. Some people do not believe that either. Certainly the teaching of the reality of the eternal state of things seems to be intended as to what this, his hope was. It appears that he longed for an eternal home and the blessing of its reality. Abraham will probably occupy a comparative position, a comparable position to that of the faithful patriarchs who lived before the giving of the covenant to Israel. In fact, Hebrews 11, 9, and 10 indicated that the same personal distinction for them as that Isaac and Jacob to leave, Ab uh, to leave Abraham, Israel, and any others out of the bridal relationship does not exclude them from the enjoyment of the city and with the bride. Revelation 21, 25 through 26. Do you understand that? Many people believe that all of the saved from here all the way to here will be in the bride, absorbed in the bride, okay? But the bride is different. You have different economies in the Bible, different economies. We have Adam, which was our first patriarch in the Bible. He, he was the leader in his time, and he fought, kind of flopped, didn't he, according to this, according to Genesis, the third chapter, he flopped. We have the age of conscience, which still didn't work, did it? Do good and offer a blood sacrifice. Cain wouldn't do it, would he? No. He wouldn't offer a blood sacrifice, and he couldn't. Jehovah himself appeared to Cain, and he would not do it. He said, if you divide correctly, if you tithe right, if you divide right, and do the right thing, you will be happy. Your face will shine and smile. Smile. Yep. Smile. You'll smile. But he said, right now your nose is red. That's what he said in Hebrew. Your nose is red. When you get mad, does people's nose get red, their eyes get red, their face gets all red, they, all this blood rushes to their face, and you see that anger in them. Yeah, they, yeah. He says, he's, uh, his, nair, his nostrils flared out and he was, his nose was red, like Rudolph, you know, the, what we call the uh, fictional Rudolph and Santa Claus. Let's go on. By faith, he pilgrim in the land of promise. Now, you, well, look at this now. This is very beautiful. Emma, has your mother taught you about promises of the Bible? Did she talk about promise if you with, if you call upon the Lord and, and ask Him to save your soul and all that? Does she taught you about that? Okay. And Caleb, has she done that? Yeah. How about that? Did you tell your children that? Uh, yeah, you did. You told them this. I'm going to tell you something. Now, we have that promise in our hearts, don't we? We know we're saved today because how God has changed our lives and the conscience that God puts in us. If we do something bad, we don't feel good. It's miserable. That's it. So we know we have that testimony in us that Spirit God is in us telling us when we do wrong. Because now we're His. You don't have that before. After you have that, then you have the leadership of the Holy Spirit in you. Every saved individual Every saved individual in the family of God has that. All the family of God. The family of God. Put that down. The family of God. Now the kingdom of God and the family of God are two different entities. Okay? The kingdom of God now is those that obey the king. Do ete. That come when he calls to them. All right? Come. In the kingdom of God, there are many saved people. There wouldn't be any gospel preached in the world today if it were not for those people that died for the last 2,000 years to keep the truth in the world. And they, were only, they only died because they had what we call dying grace. I had one person one time, I was talking to her, and she said, I think I'm going to die, but I, I, I'm scared to death. And well, she didn't die. She said, I'm just scared to death of dying. And I said, well, the Lord gives you dying grace. If you were really dying, you wouldn't be afraid. <laughs> she laughed. I guess I'm not dying then. Well, she didn't die. 
And she, when you have dying grace, now people are dying today in the world for the Lord. We know that. Islam is killing people. They've killed 270 million people, and the numbers are clicking over all the time, all the time. Mothers are seeing their children beheaded. In the book of Revelation, it talks about the kingdom of the Antichrist, the kingdom of the Antichrist, kingdom. We have the kingdom of God, we have the kingdom of the Antichrist. The kingdom of the Antichrist is going to use force and violence. Never in the history of God's church has that church, true church, ever used violence to convert anybody. I mean, I preach hellfire and damnation sermons. I do, don't I? You've heard me do that. I preach that. I tell them that there's a hell coming, and this is we all deserve that hell. That they can escape hell if they repent of their sins and call upon Jesus Christ to save them, believing that he is God's Son, that he is God the Son in flesh, Jehovah the Old Testament. And you believe that and believe that he died for your sins, that he was buried and raised for your justification. You get to go to heaven. And you're in the kingdom of God, the family of God. But what about church membership? Church membership is a different thing. In the Old Testament, what was the, the sign of the Old Testament covenant? Do you remember, Caleb? The sign of the Old Testament covenant. Eli? What was it? Circumcision. circumcision. Only the males were circumcised. And they were circumcised, and it was a physical thing. And the Jews really took a lot of stock in this. You know, when they would go into the synagogue and one body come, they inspected them, you know, make sure they had been circumcised. When Timothy was converted, he was half Jew and half Gentile, and they demanded that he be circumcised. And Paul gave in to it. Why? So he could reach them. So he could go into the synagogue with him, because if he went in there, he could go in there as a Jew, circumcised Jew, and they'd let him come in. Otherwise, they wouldn't. And even John Mark had problems with it, didn't he? Here's a disciple, the one that wrote the Gospel of Mark. He had problems. He was a Judaizer. He didn't want rubbing elbows with these Gentiles, us dogs. It's all right if they got saved, just let them be by themselves. I remember when I was going to school. It was very racial. Very racial when I went to school. I remember going to school and going to the registrar and, and write down American Indian as my nationality. And I took these tests, these entrance exam, and I passed all the remedial classes. Everything was done. I didn't have to take any remedial classes at all. No Greek, no Hebrew, nothing. All advanced. And he said, what nationality are you? And I said, American Indian. He said, I ought to make you take those tests over again because no Indian can pass like that. I heard preachers preach, some of the old-time preachers, I know you have, Brother Pedro, preach that churches are segregated. They should be segregation. You'll never prove to me where churches shouldn't be segregated. You heard it, haven't you? Yeah, I have. I heard it a lot. Now, that's kind of getting... We're getting through that type of prejudice today. Marilyn, her mother's side of the family were very prejudiced, weren't they, Marilyn? Come to find out from her side of the family, there's all kinds of bloodlines in there that they didn't like. <laughs> it's there in their DNA. It's there. You study your DNA and you find out that you're just like everybody else and you are from the three races of, of, Ham, of, of uh, Noah, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. We're all from that. You'll probably find out you're a literal descendant of Abraham because he had three wives, a Hamite, a Japhethite, and a Shemite. And that's this literal seed, the, the sands of the sea of Abraham. Is that fulfilled? Study your DNA. Just... Have it done, and you will see it. It'll do just like the Bible does. It'll go right back to the Middle East, right in that Fertile Crescent, and there's where mankind began. Right there. It goes right back there. Physical, medical science. DNA. Let's go on a little further. By faith, Abraham, sovereign in the land of promise, in a strange country, dwelling in, in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which foundations whose builder and maker is God in Hebrews 11, 9, and 10. 
Now, we have the promise of God in us that we're going to be born again. That Spirit of God in us tells us we're born again. All right? It, it, it witnesses with your soul and your body that you're born again. That Spirit does. Okay? But now let's go back and look at Jacob and Isaac and Abraham and all of them. These were real people. Do you believe that, Emma? Those were real people? All right, real people. Now, Abraham told Isaac that they were going to inherit Palestine, basically. And Isaac told Jacob that they were going to inherit Palestine. And Jacob told his 12 sons they were going to inherit Palestine. But did any of them ever literally inherit that promise? We have it so much better today because we have that promise sealed in our hearts. They never got it. They never got that promise, did they? But there's a promise coming. If you believe in the Bible, you believe in the literal interpretation of the Bible, they will have this kingdom, this Davidic and Abrahamic covenant is going to take place at the end of the tribulation period after the church age, and they're going to inhabit Palestine. Now, the kingdom, that the, the temple there, Ezekiel's temple, is much bigger than any other temple, and God has to change the topography of the land, and that is fine. God can do it, can he? Can he? He's going to make the battle of Armageddon. He's going to make that battle of Armageddon. How long is that actually going to be? It's not that big today. It's going to be 200 miles long. And it's said that blood will run in that valley up to the horse's bits. I believe that, literally. People are going to go there. They're going to die. They're going to be cut to pieces. They're going to cut each other to pieces. That's terrible, isn't it? But this is the Adamic nature of mankind. Now, that, that valley is the valley, Megiddo, is there. The plain of Megiddo is there. But that 200-mile-long valley is not in existence yet. There will be a great earthquake. When is God going to cause this great earthquake to happen? We find that's going to happen in the middle of the week when he causes the earth to protect Israel. When Israel is fleeing, literal Israel is fleeing, those that believe, the one-third left alive. At this point, the church is going to be in heaven watching everything. Right? Yes, that's right. Yeah, they're going to be feasting up there. <laughs> Listen, let me tell you this. I don't think the Lord's going to put his wife through that. His bride is special to him. Had a man one not too long ago threw his wife out on the street, and he told me that he loved her. I don't believe that. I'm not going to swallow that. Not at all. The Lord is not going to put his wife through that tribulation period. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. I don't believe that. Because he loves her. I don't want, I don't, your husband wouldn't want you to go through the fire. He's going to stand in the way for you, isn't he? Yes. Because the tribulation is a punishment time and a time to bring Israel back. Yes, that's the purpose of it. It has nothing to do with the church. After Revelation, when the chapter 4 starts, the church is gone doesn't mention her anymore. It talks all about Israel. It talks about all the Gentiles. It talks about all the tribulation upon the earth have taken place, but it doesn't say anything about the church until we get way over yonder and we see the church up in heaven. And we're going to see that. Let's go on a little bit further. It says the splendor of that city is described in glowing terms and significant language that it refers glory to the Lamb and to His wife. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials. Now, when is this? Where's the vial? I'm telling you, I don't believe in exactly how this thing does here, but we have vials. Bowls and vials are the same thing. Now, let's look and see where the church is during this time. This is during the tribulation period, okay? Let's find out where that church is. And it came there unto me, one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, or bowls, full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Hither I come here, and I will show you the bride. Is the bride down there? Is she down there? No. Where is she? In the heaven. We're talking about New Jerusalem and the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain government. The word mountain means government. The seven hills of Rome that they used to say was Rome, that's seven governments, not seven hills in Rome. <laughs> that's bad hermeneutics. 
and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and her light was likened to the stone precious and even like a jasper stone, clear and crystal, Revelation 21, 9 through 11. Christ is the center of attraction, his wife basked in the glory of his life. She's there with him, isn't she? Is she or not? Where is she? She's not down here on earth. It's just coming down out of heaven. Okay? And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. Up there in Fish Lake Valley, where I grew up, on a starlit night and a moonlit night, you don't need... Remember, Marilyn, I turned the headlights off and drove down those roads up there without headlights. You can see. There's no pollution. You can drive just like in the daytime almost. You'll see all the planes around you. I wouldn't tell you to do that all the time because it might be a wild horse or a bighorn sheep or antelope out there or a deer running out in front of you or a coyote or a wolf or something or a lion. But you can see that way. That's the light. So there's no, no need of the selma, the, uh, the, the moon, or the sun, the helios. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Revelation 21, 23. And there is no need of the tabernacle. No need of a tabernacle. What tabernacle are we talking about? That one right down yonder. That tabernacle is a type of what? God said, I want to dwell with my people, dwell, build a tabernacle. And that was a type, a picture, an allegory, a metaphor, a figure, a parable of that which was to come. Okay? And the church, God is dwelling with his people in the church in his Shekinah glory today. We have all these charismatic churches out there saying, come and we'll bless you and all this stuff, you know, and go into this ecstasy and all of that. But the real ecstasy is in God's churches. And it's not all that physical thing, because this is physical. It's the spiritual leadership of God's Spirit and His Comforter and Shekinah glory leading you into how much truth? All truth, all truth not some. There's no longer any tabernacle or church where God can be worshipped in spirit and in truth as is necessary in this age. For God himself is the temple, Revelation 21, verse 22. You know, the human mind is capable of 20 million different thoughts. 20 million different intellectual thoughts and formulae. Okay? Emma, have you got that down yet? 20 million different thoughts. How about it, Caleb? You pretty smart boy? I think so. Twenty million different thoughts at the same time. Now, I have not. They say I was pretty smart when I was young before all these strokes happened. Brother Ray remembers when I had total recall. I don't have that anymore. I'm doing pretty good for the shape I'm in. But uh, there... When we change, we'll have all of that. We'll know as we are known. Boy, this, that we'll know as we are known. We will know ourselves. Do you know yourself? Do you? Do you really know yourself? Do you know what you're going to do tomorrow? There might anything wild and contrary might happen in your life tomorrow. God knows us. God can see us in glory already. And he said, I saw no temple there in the Lord God Almighty. Look at that, Jehovah Elohim. Or Jehovah Adonai, Ha'adonaiim. El Shaddai, that's the term right there. In Hebrew, he, there's so many Hebrew, Hebrewisms in the book of Revelation that you have to know Hebrew to understand the book of Revelation because the grammar is even Hebrew. It's Hebrewisms. Jehovah Adonai, Ha'adonaiim, El Shaddai. And the Lamb or the temple of it. Revelation 21, verse 22. In the excellent work by Fred G. Stevens, he said, on the book of Revelation, is found that the best explanation of this verse known to the writer, there is no temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. Did you catch that? We go to church to get enlightened. 
We come here and we, we, we come together and we gather together to be enlightened. But the Lord will be doing the enlightening. And I think there will be an infusion from your mind, from His mind to yours. The Lord will teach us how He created all things. Every little bug. Eli, did you ever get a cold? Yep. Did you ever get an infection? Uh, I don't think so. All right. And from a scratch or anything like that? Emma, did you ever anything? She got a cold. Get the flu. You ever get the flu, Kayla? You know what that flu and what those colds are and those viruses are? They're fallen life forms. They're fallen life forms. Fallen life forms that have attached themselves to your body. Now, bacteria and things like that are supposed to help you along. I had a friend here a while back. I went uh, back up in the hills by Bishop, California. He had a few scratches and cuts on his hand. He went back up there and was dealing around in the water up there, and he got flesh-eating bacteria on him, and it almost killed him. He almost lost his hand. That's fallen life forms, people. They're real. Spirits and demons are real. They're real. They're not make-believe. They're not imagination. That we, you know, they're not spook stories. These are real. In the worship of Israel, the tabernacle, and later the temple was a place where God met with his people in spirit and form. The building itself was all the people actually saw. When you go to church, that's all the building you actually see. But the church is not the church. The church building is not the church. The church is the assembly. <coughs> and the Jehovah Witness, they have that one right. It's the assembly hall. We have assembly halls and we have assemblies. The church is the ecclesia, the assembly. They got that right. King James, when he, when he wrote his uh, Bible, he w took the word assembly and changed it to church so they'd see a building, a center. But that's not what it says. The church is the assembly. In the heavenly city, God will be with his people in a physical body, and his glorified people will have spiritual perception, which we do not have in the present world. Therefore, we will not need a physical state for a spiritual meeting with the Lord, or he will actually be with us. Hence, there will be no more need for a temple. Kind of like back to the Garden of Eden. Yes. And John saw it. The church had become the wife of the Lamb. Now, the church is the wife of the Lamb. Now, the church is not all the saved, all right, and the church is not the kingdom. Okay? The church is not all the saved, and the church is not the kingdom. Nations of saved people were walking in the light of that city. Christ is the light of it, even as he is the light of the church now. Kings of the earth, the new earth, with a new and real order, were seen bringing their glory and honor into the city. John saw that none de uh, de uh, was deprived of entering the city and that all of the redeemed were bringing glory and honor into it. Into the city. The city is the dwelling place of God. Now we have the redeemed. Many of the redeemed are not in the bride, are they? Well, are they or not? How, how could we have the bride and everybody's the bride if these other redeemed are coming in there? We have different entities. We have those in Adam's time and all the way down through the different Old Testament patriarchal times. I keep banging my microphone. I'm sure that makes lots of now noises on the recording. We see all of this. We see Abraham. We see Isaac. We see Jacob. We have the promise here. We have the Egyptian bondage over here. We have Israel coming out into their land that God gave them. They never got all of it because they didn't believe. He always had trouble with them believing, didn't he? Do you believe enough to have all the promises of God today? Do you believe enough? Do you believe and they shall bring the glory of the honor into the nations into it. Revelation 21, 26. And they saw that never again would anything that defiles or brings a shadow upon the light of Christ or his bride be permitted to enter. What a glorious fulfillment of the prophetic truth. Christ receiving glory and honor as it should be given by his redeemed people. Unto him be glory in the church. 
by the agency of Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world of end, Ephesians 3.21. That church will not just be for the millennium. What does it say? Now, we know the church is not the family of God because there's a lot of people in the family of God that aren't the church. A lot of people that are saved and in the kingdom of God, so to speak, they are citizens of the kingdom, but they're not part of the church. Now, the church is a called-out assembly of regenerated believers that have been baptized. And what is baptism in the new covenant? True baptism is the sign of the covenant. So you're not in covenant relationship with the Lord unless you have scriptural baptism. Plain as that. Plain. Okay? But are there other people in the family of God? Yes. Many people. I thank God for everyone of them that's saved. Thank God for those that are saved. The church is made up of a called out assembly of scripturally baptized and regenerated assembly. I have seen people in, in so-called God's churches that didn't act like they were regenerated. I am sure they're not members of that church in reality, in the Lord's eyes. Are they or are they not? I can tell you some of the requirements to be in a New Testament church that goes on through the eternal ages and is in close proximity and fellowship and communion with Jesus Christ like no other group of people ever were. I cannot tell you what I'm going to be in that church. Because I don't know why I'm faithful enough to do that. I can tell you that it's a special entity forever with the Lord. I know that I'm saved. I know that I've been scripturally baptized. I know that. But I don't know whether I'm going to be worthy. And I, I, and I don't even say that. That's, that's the wrong term in all reality. Whether I'll be in that assembly or not. Because that is a very special thing. I believe Paul's going to be there and Peter. And a lot of those Waldenses and Petrobrusians that died. And I know that during the tribulation period, and these people are not in the church. Church is gone. But they're going to be ruling and reigning with Christ forever because they died in a special way and with, a, with an intensity that we don't have today, even though there are people in the world dying for Christ today. And many of them are not even in true New Testament churches, but they're in the family of God. And God is giving them the grace to stand up with what light they have. And God will judge you according to what light you have. Always. He's just in it. Let's go on a little bit further. The church uh, is now the promised bride of Christ. The promised bride of Christ. Not everybody in a New Testament church is in the bride. She's the promised bride. What does the bride do? What is the bride supposed to do? Supposed to be a virgin when she marries her husband, isn't she? That's the way the Bible teaches. I mean, that's not what happened in the world today. They're well used sometimes. That's all they ever get to the altar, women are. And men, too. We're not virgins. We're not virgins. But the bride is a virgin. The bride has laid everything in the world aside, and she's given it to her Lord. <laughs> That's a high order, isn't it? That's a high order. In Revelation 19 to 7, the wedding has not taken place yet. It is as the betrothed bride that she operates in the world today. For I am a jealous over you, uh, Paul says in 2 Corinthians, with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin by Christ, 2 Corinthians 11 and 2. I am jealous that I have espoused you. Now, what does the word espoused mean? Do you remember what that word means there, Brother Pedro? Espoused. Okay. The word is espoused there. The word is he me sa main. He se sa main. We got a word. How many of you drink milk? Anybody drink milk around here? And is the milk homogenized? It says homogenized only if you buy it in the store. Homogenized milk. And what does homogenized milk do, Marilyn? We have, we have uh, had non-homogenized milk, and non-homogenized milk 
separates from the what we call the skim milk from the cream on top. Well, they call it pasteurized. Pasteurized and homogenized milk yeah. because it mixes so it does not separate the cream from the light milk. It naturally does that. When I lived in Fish Lake Valley on the Snow Goose Ranch, we had a cow that was half Holstein and half Angus. She looked just like an Angus cow. She was black. Her name was Boots. We go out there and we'd milk that cow and we'd take that milk home and it would not separate. It was homogenized. It wouldn't separate. It would not separate. People would come over there and they and they sat at our dinner table and drank that milk and they said, Man, this is great milk. Where do you get this milk? And it's fresh milk. Fresh milk normally does a, it separates. We couldn't make butter out of her milk. It was all there. This cow's given homogenized milk. <laughs> what does the word homogenized mean? Uh, homogenized. It means to make things cling together. It means to put in harmony. Harmony comes from this word homogenized. So the church's job today is to take people that are in harmony with God. That's, the, that's it. I've espoused you. I have trying to homogenize you. All right. In this passage, Paul tells the relation of Corinthian church to Christ and how that he had betrothed them to Christ as his bride. The Greek word which comes from his spouse is harmosoman, which comes from the root harmazo, and the word carries the thought of fit together. Remember, homogenized? To join, to unite in marriage. And it is from this Greek word that the English word harmony comes. And the church in Corinthian had been fitted together in such a way and brought together in harmony with God's plan and purpose that she was then the bride of Christ. She was espoused to be the bride of Christ. She wasn't the bride of Christ. She was espoused, set in harmony. Your job, Mother Pedro, is to make those people homogenized. My job is to homogenize people for the Lord. You may not find a boots like we had in Fish Lake Valley, to give homogenized milk. I have never seen another cow like that. Boots was one of the kinds. But that milk was good. God's Word is good when we homogenize it and make it real in our lives. Do you have any questions? Yes. So you said that there was three distinctions between um, the bride, the church, the kingdom, and the kingdom, whatever. Okay. Everybody that's born again is in the family of God. All right. And the kingdom of God is that entity in the world today. Today, the kingdom of God one day will be a literal kingdom on this earth still. But the Lord left his church to be the administrators, and he gave them the keys of the kingdom, didn't he not? Didn't give them to Peter. The Catholic Church swear they gave them to Peter. And it was successive down to the popes. But the keys were given to the church, not to Peter, to the church. And if you remember the New Testament church, there are the keys of the kingdom. So the you kingdom of God is the new Is the entity. Today, the kingdom of God is the entity of God's ruling realm. It's his realm. Okay? And there are saved people in the... In, there are saved people in the family of God in, within that kingdom. The people that are actually espoused to him, homogenized him, trying to get him homogenized to follow him, will be part of that church forever. How much does it take to be part of the church, part of the bride? How much does it take? Everything. You want to be part of the bride? Just give your life wholly to that purpose. And maybe the Lord will say, come here. And he will, you will be in a special relationship with him forever. And we're not talking about salvation there. We're talking about a homogenized communion with God that no one else has because this is going to last forever. So we have the family of God. That's everyone that's saved. Yes. And we have the kingdom of God. That's the people that, that are in the realm. the realm of obeying him and following him. Yeah, one stage of it or another. And then what's the next? 
the first kingdom of God, those people within the kingdom of God, are saved. They're within the kingdom of God. They're, they're part of the kingdom of God. Okay, they're citizens of the kingdom, but they're not the administrators of the kingdom. The administrators of the kingdom is the church in the world today. So you see all of that. Did you, did you learn anything from this, Pedro? That makes it clearer, 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 clear like mud. <laughs> all right, clear like mud. All right. Anything else, Carrie, Emma, no? You can write a question down to me if you want. You don't have to ask me. Just write it. How about you, Caleb? Did you get something today? Did you learn something today? Did you learn something today, Eli? You're bright as bright. I can tell that. Always bright. Bright eyes. And I liked your picture out there at the fair, too. You did fine. Boy, that one of Emma was starry. Tremendous. Tremendous. That should have been number one. <laughs> you tell your mom that. All right, let's go out and do something eternal. No other questions? All right. Brother Roger, would you dismiss us in prayer, brother? Thank all of you for being here.